So I'm going to touch briefly on uh, markets for, you know, different agricultural waste, but spend most of my time talking about equine, and in part just because it's really one of the most simplistic uh, inputs that we've come across that we compost in our systems. So my goal <laughs> has always been to figure out the value from the waste. And going to equine first was really uh, came about because I partnered with someone who had done food waste and biosolids composting and had created these in-vessel systems. And when I came on board with the company, I said, gee, why don't we go check out ag waste? And he was amazed at the simplicity of uh, equine stable waste. And even though there are slight variations, somebody's going to feed their horse, you know, different things. Overall, it is an incredibly homogenous product and very clean. You compare it with your other uh, waste sources and it is probably the cleanest that we have come across. So early projects that got me started in this uh, was one for the United States Army. It was a fascinating project in composting organics that were bogging down a burned energy program. And we came in and said, you know what, I think we can run these through our in-vessel systems and dry it out enough that it can go into your burned energy program. And we did, boosted the, um, the uh, burn value by 22%. They were thrilled. And when the pilot was over, it went to process the stable waste from the caisson horses uh, for Arlington National Cemetery. So doing that, we were able to get a very early glimpse at some of the uses for this output. Uh, we've been working with them for doing bedding reuse. Of course, they're worried, as are you know, other people, about the perception of using compost as bedding. And we also worked with them on using the product as a mulch. They need tremendous volumes of mulch for the cemetery. And uh, this material was tested, I can't even tell you how many times, because the Army, I think, comes up with tests that no one else has. <laughs> and the material continually passed these tests with flying colors. EOS Ranch on Bainbridge Island, which is where I'm from, uh, was also willing to take one of these vessels and start doing their stable waste. So we had some place that we could monitor every day. This was a place where I ended up doing some testing on uh, my own for the bedding reuse. So what I was able to do is create these assumptions. And the assumptions were that we were going to be able to find value in the output material, uh, either for bedding reuse or on a secondary market for mulch or soil amendment. So my job was to create the value. And what I really believed was that, and I'm sorry, my little guy with the cart there, but you know, it's all about the money. And getting people to change their habits uh, is exceedingly difficult. And unless I could go in and tell them, you know, show them the analysis and say, this is what you're going to save and have it be a substantial amount, I found that the whole process of thinking about this and spending the capital cost was prohibitive. So. One of my jobs in doing, you know, in finding this value, and let me see if I've got my, my s slides right. Well, I'll, I'll get back to that one second. But really what was driving anybody looking to me for answers was suddenly being hit with regulation, uh, which I will agree someone earlier today was talking about regulations exist, but really nothing happens to you unless someone complains. And those are the phone calls that I got as well, is once, you know, they had to change their ways. Some people recognize it as good business to be proactive and come up with their waste management plans and look for this value as well. Unfortunately, they're probably a small percentage. So going back to the value proposition, I knew that I could create a better product by adding technology to the composting process. But of course, adding this technology was also increasing the capital cost for the project. So to justify that, I needed to find markets that were going to pay a higher price for the product on the other end. And if I was thinking about on-site use, you know, the numbers I would be able to work with was uh, avoided cost of disposal fees and uh, avoided cost of about, we figured, between 30 and 40 percent of their bedding costs. We also looked at things, uh, if there was landscape costs, 
uh, for mulch or soil amendment on the property or if they were importing material to improve their fields or their jumping fields. Those of, uh, of you who are on the tour, you know, got to see how wonderful the compost was able to improve the jumping field over on Bainbridge. So off-site, um, I started looking at really what was going to be the most secure market, and uh, it wasn't always the one that was going to bring the highest value. But to get these projects started, I felt it was very important to have a secure buyer. And that's where we started looking into um, box stores or uh, specialty soil companies or uh, distribution centers for companies such as Scott's, you know, bagging facilities. And they would only buy in 10,000 yard bulk um, purchases. So that would only take care of our, our really, you know, the largest of the farms that we were working with. We also then looked at um, very specific regional markets, uh, greenhouse growers, uh, particular, you know, needs. Yeah, funny enough, the states that uh, have marijuana use, they're very strict composting regulations on that. They're looking for some bulking material as well as uh, certainly food waste. So what this technology, you know, could bring, really it offers you more control. And so whether it's moisture, it's aeration, it's temperature, um, what's one of the most interesting things I think about these controls is being able to run the material through quite quickly if you're trying to do bedding reuse and you preserve the integrity of the shavings and that allows you as an option to be able to screen the material once it's coming out of the vessel and then you've got your fines which are a better soil amendment anyway and you've got your larger pieces of shavings to go back into bedding. So the next, you know, obstacle I came across was, uh, you know, it was an certainly a barrier in uh, some places around the country, and that was they had really jumped on board without doing their research. Millions of dollars had been spent on systems. One was a burned energy system in Kentucky. Another was, I believe it was another burned energy system down in Wellington. Uh, one operated for about six weeks, one for three months. They were shut down, never to be started up again. And so I would go marching into some of these markets and say, you know, I've got a great idea for you. And unless I was willing to put up the money and put the system in to prove that it was going to work, I was not getting a lot of traction. So I decided, well, you know, I'm going to have to find a partner in this, and actually two partners. And one was reaching out to the academic world to try to get some more science behind it, and the other was reaching out to the government to try to get some funding. So uh, I was very, very lucky. My company had excellent relations with a lot of researchers around the country. And those researchers actually led me to some grant opportunities. And there were some very well-developed systems, uh, Maryland being one of them, and I'm going to speak quite a bit about that. But they realized that part of this research had to be finding and establishing really secure market channels. A lot of the science that I needed also was going to back up the bedding reuse proposition, and that was going to be certainly with pathogen reduction and an unintended consequence, actually, that we found as we went along, which were health benefits for the animals. So Maryland, uh, they have more horses, at least this is, you know, accor according to Maryland, uh, they have the largest number of horses per acre in the country. So I had ample opportunity back there to, to find some willing participants. They had enforcement of regulation, uh, the Chesapeake Bay being, you know, in dire straits and a lot of focus and a lot of money being put on controlling that situation. And incentives for uh, market development. So in Maryland, they put together the Maryland Environmental Services, which reports directly to the governor. And a lot of funding was put into that, and it was recognizing the whole, you know, life cycle, the whole market channel, the inputs, the outputs, 
how all this was going to work, and they realized that the, you know, fixing one part of that was not going to solve the problem. They had to really look at the, at the uh, overall life cycle. And so they work very closely with the Maryland Department of Agriculture. Um, the Department of Agriculture was given grant money. And what was very interesting about that is I got their RFP. <laughs> it was overwhelming. It took me easily the better part of a month. And I applied for two different projects, 65 page you know, return applications. And we studied uh, you know, the economic consequences of what we were doing. It was, it was the most thorough and complete application I've ever done. And I think it was well worth it. So the other thing back in Maryland that's very interesting is the opportunity for the use of the output. The largest growing uh, business sector in Maryland is, are the greenhouse growers. And they are located right there on the eastern shore, really easy access for a lot of the uh, manure issues. And not to go too deep into this, because I think other talks have, but you know we're going back to talking about the potting medium, the peat moss replacement, and the fact that the EPA is wanting to shut down or has shut down. Uh, peat bogs in the United States, so this material is being shipped in really at great cost from Canada. So beyond the greenhouse growers, also in Maryland, there are soil specialty companies. Those are ones that create soils for ball fields, golf courses, you know, anything that you want to put together, you go to them and they're going to mix up their special recipe. They buy in very large quantities, 10,000 yards uh, per purchase. Um, talked about the greenhouse growers, uh, there's manufacturing plants back there for box stores and uh, national producers such as Scott's. The other thing that I found which ended up being key are uh, nonprofit horse farms, whether they're therapeutic riding programs or rescue uh, farms. There's also a, a great program back there, matching up nutrients, uh, who has them and who needs them. And so that is a source for a certain, you know, for some on-farm application. And then if somebody really wants to get uh, energetic and uh, decide to produce a retail product, you've got four, you know, very large cities, high density, uh, fairly liberal, green thinking people who would love to buy some wonderful Chesapeake compost that's going to uh, save their beautiful Chesapeake Bay. So what I needed to do is, is several things, and starting with being able to compare our stable waste with a potting medium or peat moss replacement. And we found quite early on that at least our assumptions were made that it was going to be compatible. I will tell you that the studies are still going on right now. Uh, I am incredibly fortunate to be working with Dr. Pat Milner at USDA Beltsville. Uh, she right now is, excuse the pun, but we're kind of putting the cart before the horse and she's actually doing uh, poultry in the in vessel system right now before it goes to the horse farm and I'll loop back to that in a minute. So we don't have our final results, but preliminarily we are looking good on this particular part of it. So the unintended consequence is another thing that's going to help, I think, change the perception of the horse world, and those are increased uh, health benefits for the horses. And you're going to hear in just, uh, I think, two more speakers. Caitlin Price Youngquist is going to speak to this. I, again, had the very good fortune of meeting her and working with her on Bainbridge Island, and she had a project up in Snohomish about bedding reuse and tracking some of these health benefits. Uh, this is, she'll be talking about this in, in her program. And some of the very simple tests we ran also with this material were absorption capabilities, uh, huge increase in absorption after uh, being composted. These I'm going to let you go through uh, on your own if you want to look this up, but we did so many lab testings. It was, it was done basically every two weeks all through this, and we'll continue this when we're back in Maryland, and all of these results have came back uh, with very, very good results. So Days End Horse Rescue was the recipient of one of our grants back there. They do just an amazing thing in rescuing horses. 
I, I, it's really, it's both disheartening and very encouraging, uh, the number of horses. They have up to 90 horses at any time on their site. And to think that all of those are, uh, you know, rescued, oftentimes people just drop them off, they can't feed them anymore, but also they go through court cases to rescue horses. Anyway, they were very willing to look at the bedding reuse because they don't have clients they have to answer to. And if indeed the bedding reuse can offer a viable bedding for these horses that's safe, uh, it cuts their costs significantly. The other location that we got was one of the oldest dairy farms in Maryland. And they will be using a site-built system, which is, uh, instead of the in-vessel, which we're using at the horse facility, it has the same technology, a lower capital cost, because it's built within concrete bunkers. And I might add, too, I forgot to mention at the beginning of this with Maryland, and that is that a very interesting thing happened in Maryland. When the EPA cracked down as hard as they did on the Chesapeake Bay, Regulation was put into effect immediately, and an, a, another unintended consequence came up, and that was they lost a significant percentage of their small to medium-sized farms, because those farms could not afford the options that were on the table at that point for their waste management. And Maryland recognized this, so they backed off of the regulations until they could put in place options that were financially and environmentally sustainable. And I thought that took a lot of foresight. I, th I think they've done a, a tremendous job in realizing that it's, you know, the private sector and, and private money is not going to step in uh, until they know what their risk is. And that risk can be minimized by some of this testing being done models proven, and then I think the problem will be taken over uh, by the private sector with businesses seeing an opportunity here. So I would be remiss in not talking about these persistent uh, herbicides. And what we have worked with several different sites on is really leveraging the hay that they buy, and when you think about 90 horses, that's not an ins insignificant amount of hay or amount of money. And if they trace, whether it's through their dealer or they're buying directly from a farmer, if they know the source of their hay and they know what herbicides are being used, then they have been able to, to leverage, um, you know, which herbicide will be used and which won't. Also, very simple testing. We talked about that in the last session. Uh, education, you know, know what's going on, know what the regulations are as far as the herbicides are going. So what is in the future? This is pretty interesting as well because we realize that small farms, the one, two, three horse farms, even up to 10, it's difficult for them to make enough product to balance out what I was talking about at the beginning, which is you know, getting enough money on the back end to sustain the capital cost on the front end. And so we're really looking at collection yards. And there is investment money that's very interested in doing this, if we can prove the model. What it also offers us is Taking the equine, which again, you know, clean, easy to compost, but low in nutrients, and possibly taking in other sources, whether it would be small quantities of food waste, what we're really leaning towards is, and there's ample supply of it in Maryland, is poultry waste. So that is where we are, are hoping this will, uh, will go to. So we can cover everyone, you know, large, large farms, small farms, everything in between. So this is hopefully where I've led you to, is realizing there, <laughs> there is the potential of value in those manure piles. Do you have any questions? Yes. Yeah, really good question. Um, Five dollars a yard to highest I've worked with is 65. 
it's, well, that's an interesting story just because it's on Martha's Vineyard. So everything is imported. And suddenly people are waking up there to the fact that they could be making some pretty nice compost on island. Wow. Hmm. Our business models, however, we tried to build, I think it's mostly on $10 a yard because we did not want to overinflate our figures. Yes? Well, what's interesting is that we have one at University of Maine. And when we first sent it back there, they would send us pictures of these icicles hanging off of the, uh, you know, the lower part of the outside of the vessel. And then they'd open up the doors and steam would billow out. So yes, we are pretty confident. We also can do heated aeration if we needed to.